Hello and welcome to day five of this year's Confetti Industry Week. It's been a great week, starting with advice from our previous students to an in-depth interview with Noel Clark and exploring concept art and directing with Paul Campion with plenty of other great talks. Don't forget to tag us and use the hashtag IW21 when sharing your posts on social media. In this session we welcome John Holmes who will be talking to you about practical advice on colour grading and VFX on low budget productions. Please use the Q&A function, not the chat function, to ask your questions and we'll aim to answer as many as you can, but only if it goes in the Q&A box. We hope you enjoy today's session and a massive thank you to John for taking time out to join us today for our 15th Confetti Industry Week. And now I hand over to you, John. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. I'm just going to share my screen so we can get started. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Um, Right, it's lovely to meet you all. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. Um, I say the purpose of coming here today really is to share some practice with you. And um, I would never claim that there's only one way of doing any uh, of anything in any anything that we do. Um, but the thing I really want to promote is I just want to share some of the things and insights that I have and still do um, help me in my role as a colorist and VFX artist working on independent short and feature film work really. And I thought the best way to do that was, I could be anecdotal. I could just talk about stories and things like that, but that would probably, um, for me anyway, that would probably wouldn't be that all that exciting because I'm not an exciting person. That said, I work on exciting things. So hopefully um, me framing what I do and what I've experienced and what I've learned in the context of the work that I'm working on, then hopefully that'll make this a little bit more exciting than me just talking about myself. So my aim then today really is just for the sake of brevity and clarity i'm going to focus on a small sample of scenarios for, from some active projects so i've been lucky enough to get permission just to show you some um some shots and use some examples from films that i'm currently working on uh, that haven't yet been distributed haven't been yet been delivered so it's nice that i've got the the rights to show you a few shots from this and I'm going to use those just to exemplify some of the tools and com, um, kind of common practices and workflows that I use on a regular basis as both a colorist and as a kind of VFX artist on these small indie, sometimes low or no budget films. OK, and that's where I'm coming from. I suppose the idea then is hopefully because these are often projects um, coming from a similar context or a similar kind of budget constraints from what you might be experiencing, understandably as a student or someone starting out maybe these feel a little bit more practical a little bit more possible and i'm trying to maybe give you things that you can use on a day-by-day -day basis starting right now so that's my aim uh, and hopefully i get close to that all right so at the end of this hopefully it'll either reframe all the wonderful stuff that your lecturers have already taught you or it might just reinforce that stuff that they've taught you or it might just give you a few more terms and methodologies under your belt that you can then hopefully go off and expand and explore a little bit further okay so i'm not going to claim that this is the only way to do something because that would be just wildly incorrect to do that the important thing is is that you find a way that suits you my hope then is is that whatever i show you whatever i kind of whatever insights i give you will just help you on that journey as it were okay so um my first kind of theme really is the idea of starting with neutral so this is me trying to ex kind of brand and make it more exciting in a catchy phrase, the concept of my color correction workflow. All right. And I've tried to kind of summarize and simplify this down to kind of a typical workflow that I go through when, when I'm um, color grading a film. And um, I've kind of broken this down into four stages. Again, this is just me trying to illustrate the way I do things. And, and I'll explain why I do them in a particular order in a second. Um, there is a method to my madness, there is a logic, and, and I think that's the important thing is that you find a logic, not only that suits you and suits the tool that you might be using and suits the project that you're working on, but also is informed by some form of, I suppose, technical workflow or technical knowledge, okay? Because yes, it's great to find your own workflow, it's great to be creative, but there's certain things you need to be aware of, um, and this is what I'm trying to get across, I suppose, with this workflow, yeah? So, um, in terms of uh, the workflow that I'm showing on screen here is my first stage really is the primary balancing stage. And I've kind of broken this down into three stages, exposure, color balance, and then saturation. 
So the first thing I do typically is do a primary pass, a kind of neutralization pass, if you will. So that's where I get the, the footage uh, edited together on a timeline. It'll come to me via an XML file. I'll reconnect the, the original camera files if they're been shot in a scene referred raw based format or a log based format, which might be too heavy for the editor. They'll send me an XML that they've edited using some proxies. I'll reconnect the camera originals to that, to that uh, timeline and start obviously working with those hopefully data rich um, files to get the best possible image quality out of them. But the first thing I do before I even get a client in the room and by client, I mean, cinematographer, the director, um, before I get them in the room and, uh, and waste their time, just watching me check the white balance and get a, a relative exposure. Correct. Uh, that's the thing I'll do. I'll get the exposure right for a shot. Um, and I'll look at a scene and I'll probably pick the shot in the scene that's got the the most elements in it. So it'll usually be the establishing shot, you know. So if you've got two people in a two shot and it cuts to close ups, I'll typically start with the wider two shot. If there is one that has pretty much representation of the whole kind of location, skin tones, relative brightness, uh, brightest value, darkest value. I'll pick that shot and use that as my starting point. I'll get the exposure approximately in a neutral state. And by neutral state, I'll think, right, what's the darkest thing in this shot? Let's get that close to zero, say on a zero to 100 IRE scale. I'll look to see which is a, if there's a specular highlight and position that roughly towards the top of the scale and everything in between. Then I'll do the color balance. So I'll look at the kind of the idea of the white balance in the shot. And I'll use hopefully some form of gray card, white card, or the chevrons on a clapperboard as a neutral starting point to get that color balance approximately right. And then once I've done that, then I'll go on to the saturation of the, looking at the overall saturation. And to help me with that saturation, again, if there's a color chart in there, wonderful. I've got a known kind of benchmark to kind of say how saturated should my cyans be, my, my, my greens, my yellows. But if I haven't got that, and most of the time, if you haven't got that, then there's usually a flesh tone in there because usually we're making films about people. Then I'll use my flesh tone as a reference point for that saturation level. So roughly, you know, if it's a female skin tone, then I'll, it's typically about, you know, if, a, if you're saturating on a vector scope from zero saturation to say a relative 100% saturation, a female skin tone, I'll typically have around 30, 35% and the male skin tone slightly less. It's just an approximation. It's just a guide. It's just a starting point. But all of those things will help me then get to a neutral start. And I suppose that all sounds very dry, sounds a bit dull. And to be honest, it probably is. But the reason for doing that is really important. We're really guilty sometimes of just diving straight in and saying, I want it to look like this. I want it to be an orange teal look. I want it to look like Transformers, so on and so forth. The problem is it's not your film more often than not. And there's a cinematographer involved, there's a director involved, there's a client involved that have their vision and your responsibility is to make their vision happen. And if you don't start with a neutral start before they walk in, if they say, I want a green hue to that, or I want to push yellow into the highlights, or I want this, or I want that. If you haven't got a neutral balanced start, then if you're adding green into an already incorrect image, an unbalanced image, then your green might be brown. Yeah, you add green to yellow, you'll get a different color than if your highlights, your mid-tones, your grays, your blacks, your neutral values in that shot aren't neutralized in the first place. So, but this is all stuff that you don't want to be doing in front of them. So if there's one tip is get that primary pass done first before anyone even sits in a room with you to then start talking about the creative side of color grading. And by having a neutral starting point, it means then that you can be really quick with your kind of, I suppose, look development, You're kind of developing different types of look. And then you can just toggle those on and off, knowing that you've got a neutral starting point to go back to. So that would be my, my first tip, and that's typically what I do first. My reason for doing exposure before color balance and saturation as well is that obviously most of the time, Luma is the strongest part of a video component, yeah? Our view, human visual system is more sensitive to luminance than it is chrominance. Yeah, it's the way we see the world. We need luminance to see detail, to make out objects. We can do without color. But color is just that happy kind of thing on the end that helps us differentiate between what a thing is. So because of that, obviously, we know because of chroma subsampling, you know, luminance or luma is always the priority in that in that in that pathway. Yeah. So if we're going to lose anything, we lose color before we use luma. 
and then, and then inevitably, if you do your exposure pass first, if you add contrast to an image just in the luminance part of the signal, then inevitably, and you've probably seen this, as soon as you add contrast, it often affects saturation because they're kind of interconnected in that regard. In simple terms, I don't want to get too much individual engineering. But the idea is that if you do your contrast first, then adapt your saturation. You're not then having to go back and forth so much. If you were to do your saturation first, then do your luma contrast. That would inevitably change your saturation level, which you'd then have to go back and tweak again. So I tend to do exposure first because those luma adjustments in terms of contrast, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, adjusting your highlights, your shadows, so on and so forth, your relative contrast, your contrast ratio has an impact on saturation. Yeah, so I tend to do saturation second or any color based ad adjustment second. So that's my primary balance. Second one is an optional one. So for example, if you've got a one shotter, so a whole scene is in one shot, this, this part stage is useless. But if you've got multiple shots within a scene that have all meant to be shot under the same conditions, same location, same lighting, color temperature, so on and so forth, then this is where, for example, I've, I've already established that I would do my primary pass on the widest shot, maybe the establishing shot where everything is in the frame that's in the scene. Once I've done that, I'll ripple or copy and paste those adjustments across all the different shots in that scene. And then I would then balance the values between them. And in an ideal situation, they've all been shot evenly, they've all been shot the same, but more often than not, there's conditions, especially on low budget indie projects where speed is of the essence, you can't always get that um, exact match between your close-ups, your medium shots, your establishing shots. So the continuity pass is what I do ne next, which is basically rippling the primary adjustment across all the shots in the scene. Once that's done, I know that my scene across the board is neutral. So I've got a neutral point from which I can then start building the next stage, which is this idea of look development, one of the best phrase yeah, is building that look, which is what most people associate with color grading or being a colorist. Yeah, it's the creative bit. It's kind of saying, I want this scene to have this particular look to it. It's this particular time of day. It's it's all, uh, oh, it's this particular point in the narrative. I want the narrative at this point to kind of lose its saturation, to kind of have a bit more of a, a bleachy, desaturated look with a bit more contrast in it because everything's gone a bit pear-shaped narratively. Yeah, so that's, that's where we start to make those creative decisions, knowing that we've got a neutral baseline to work from. OK, uh, and then, as I say, this is typically only applied once the primary balancing is complete. So then once I've done that, once I've had a creative use of Luma and Chroma and that's done in conjunction. And this is typically where the cinematographer director would be with me at this point. Then I then think about secondary isolation. And again, this is an optional stage because it's not needed every shot. But this is where you might say, right, I've done my primary balancing. I've rippled it across all the shots, but there's still an issue with that shot, which was so much brighter in the highlights, or there was something clipped there or I lost some sky detail, or uh, the cinematographer might have not been happy because the lantern went out that day. Yeah. And they suddenly had to, they want a bit more fill or, or there's too much bounce on one side. Yeah. So they want to just darken that area. So this is where we'd, we've done the creative bit. We've done the neutral bit. Then we come in and start to make those isolations and make those decisions as to say, look, could we just stop down the sky, maybe a couple of stops just to kind of bring some of the sky detail out? Could we just do a, like a power window just to kind of almost vignette the image and draw the attention more so to the actor or actress that's on screen? So that's where those secondary isolations come in. And again, I tend to do those at the very end because again, if I'm undoing looks and undoing primary stuff and we're going back and forth and we're not quite, we haven't quite settled on what that look is, if I start doing the secondary isolation too early, I, I might have to go back and redo those things because they're not a problem anymore, depending on the look, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, so depending on the creative look you've gone for, you might not have the need to do secondary isolations. Or if you've gone for a much brighter or darker look, it might be more impactful, so you do have to go. So I tend to leave those to the very end. Um, so that's my kind of order of operations typically. Yeah, it's not a hard and fast rule, it's something I've found that works for me. And again, the really big tip really there is making sure that for me is do exposure before you do any color-based adjustments in your primary part, because exposure inevitably impacts uh, saturation levels. I would, and a, another little tip, I know this is an aside, I haven't put that there, I probably should have done. I tend to do my exposure kind of uh, exposure tonal adjustments. I strip all the saturation out of the image. So I'm just focused on a grayscale image. I've got my Y waveform, of course, so I've kind of empirically checked where I'm at, but I tend to like to view 
things in terms of tonal range of grayscale when I'm doing the exposure adjustments. And then if it works that way, then I reintroduce saturation back in and do my chroma adjustments from that point onwards. And I've just found that's useful. And that's why a lot of viewfinders, for example, even now on high-end um, digital cinema cameras are still black and white. And a lot of cinematographers still prefer that way, is that they're just focused on tonality rather than just uh, being kind of, uh, I suppose, uh, kind of, um, yeah, without color getting in the way, basically. Um, so just to exemplify this then, um, there's my four stages. I worked hard on those colors. Um, okay, so let's do have a bit of a demo. So let's make sense of this and just put this into practice. So what I've got here is a shot that I've been kindly been allowed to show you from a feature film that's in progress. Um, uh, and this is Lapwing, which was filmed a couple of years ago, but obviously because of this whole pandemic thing, everything's got a little bit more delayed than it could or should have been. Um, and this is a film starring Hannah Douglas, Emmett Scanlon, Sebastian de Souza, and Sarah Whitehouse, as, as well as many other fantastic people. And this was shot in and around the Midlands area by people from the East Midlands. And also I'm a full-time lecturer when I'm not doing this kind of stuff and, um, there was quite a few of my students involved in this project from the University of Lincoln where I work. And so it was a nice project to work on, high production value, shot very quickly across just over two weeks, which is amazing for a feature film out on location. Um, but the whole look of this thing was about big skies, um, kind of lots of, it's based next to the coast, the East Coast, lots, lots of sea, lots of big skies, kind of very much in kind of keeping and, and I suppose I suppose the look they were going for was very much that talent, Terence Malick, uh, 70s kind of look to things, kind of almost like everything's shot in and around Magic Hour. And as you know, Magic Hour in the UK is about 10 minutes. So um, you have to do a lot of work in post to try and make it look that way. Um, so what I've got here is a shot which hopefully you can see and I'll play back. And the whole idea of this shot is that um, it's based in and around kind of I suppose dusk, uh, if not kind of sunset time, that kind of magic hour feel, kind of not too harsh on the contrast, um, introducing lots of warmth into there, it, uh, kind of almost like a romanticized view of things. Yeah, we're not looking for a binary kind of blacks at zero, whites at a hundred IRE. We're trying to kind of stay in between there. And that's one of the things I'd observe, especially about that look of that time as well. Um, so if, if I just quickly toggle off what it looked like in its kind of neutral state, what you've got is, I suppose, this typical video-ish look to things, you know, digital stuff tends to look, looks very pleasant. It was shot 6K raw on a red, uh, a red epic, I believe. And then obviously that's then we create proxies from all those raw files that's sent to the editor. The edit, editor does their edit. They send the XML back to me. I reconnect the raw. And then I start my color grade. And I've, as you'll see, I have a standard set of nodes. Now I'm working in DaVinci Resolve, which I think is it, is it is a tool and it's a good tool for me, but it's not the only tool. So this is definitely not a software piece of training. This is not me advocating that you must use DaVinci Resolve, but I it suits me and it works for me. But the thing I tend to do first off is I, I and if you've used DaVinci Resolve, you can just, once you've built a node tree, you can capture it as a still, store that in the gallery and apply that that node tree to every other shot. So that's typically how I ripple changes across a number of shots. But what I tend to do is build empty nodes and label them before I even start a grade. And then what I do is grab a still of that with all these empty nodes with no adjustments on them, just with labels. So I have a pre-arranged, pre-created node tree that, that I can then apply to every shot and every project. I know it sounds slightly nerdy, but it just means, it reminds me in my elderly state that, oh yeah, I should be doing things in this order. It also kind of just, just gives me space and it just speeds up my workflow. So I tend to always have, you'll see here, the first node in my node tree is noise reduction. Now, there's lots of kind of debates in the color grading world about whether noise reduction should happen at the beginning or happen at the end. Um, noise reduction is becoming more and more a kind of necessary evil uh, because lots of people are shooting on, yes, they're shooting scene referred formats, color spaces, but they're shooting on video formats that have chroma subsampling and, or they, they may be shooting with maybe low signal to noise ratios because all these cameras say they can shoot basically at midnight in the dark and you don't realize that obviously the weaker the signal, the more a noise there is. Um, so inevitably these often noise reduction needed in the first 
instance. And I tend to noise reduce first to try and get rid of some of the negative byproducts of that chroma subsampling that you get with video formats where there's less chroma than there is Luma. Uh, I believe if you don't do it first, then what you've got is lots of this kind of um, artifacting and aberrations in that noise that are adding random bits of chroma and color pollution into your signal. So then if I start color grading on top of that, I'm working with this image that's constantly evolving and changing in terms of its chroma. So I tend to like putting noise reduction at, at the beginning. But if I highlight this noise reduction node and come to my noise reduction settings, hopefully you can see this. In this, I only do spatial based noise reduction and I, I only do it in the chroma channel. I leave Luma alone. So basically I'm leaving the Luma, the detail intact. I don't want to start softening or noise reducing that, but I tend to put all my noise reduction into the chroma side of things to get rid of some of that, that chroma subsampling noise. Or because this is raw, you know, some of this kind of these images have so much latitude now and dynamic range that inevitably some of that noise floor that sits in the lower end of the signal manifests itself. So that's a that's another thing that I'm consciously aware of. The other workflow perk of putting it at, on my first node is because I can cache that noise reduction. So in terms of playing stuff back, if I put it in the first node and I've got a, a dedicated cache hard drive on my system, if I cache that noise reduction to my uh, to my hard drive, then it means I don't have to keep recaching it. If it was at the end of the chain and I was doing color adjustments before that noise reduction, every time I make a noise, uh, every, sorry, every time I make a color adju adjustment, it's then going to have to update the noise reduction downstream, which then means it's slowing down your playback. It's having to re kind of cache and re-render all your color adjustments when in fact it could be caching the noise reduction first and then any color adjustments made after that it's not having to recache the noise in order for those to be manifest. Hopefully that makes sense. I know it's kind of a slightly nerdy thing, but it helps me. So if I switch this grade back on, you can see hopefully the difference between that. Um, you'll see there's a logical order similar to what I was showing you before. Uh, and I'm going to kind of turn these off one by one. So what I'll do is just toggle these off. Um, and hopefully what you'll see, uh, I've got the chromacity um, kind of color gamut chart down in the bottom right hand side here. I'm not going to uh, teach granny to suck eggs. I'm not going to tell you what that is and what that means. Again, your lectures are a, a much better place probably to tell you what that's about. But just to exemplify what I mean about the kind of pollutive power of the noise. Um, can you see as soon as we go into this shot and start putting noise reduction on, you can see a lot of the pollution in there already is this noise. Yeah. So even in this red raw file, if this was an S log file with S gamma, you'd see the noise just pinging and hitting the going beyond the parameters of rec 709 color gamma. And it would just create all kinds of pollution, especially in the low end of your signal. So noise reduction first is really helpful. Then I come in and balance this. Yeah. And balancing this is, um, not only neutralizing things, but balancing it in the context of the scene. So sometimes, you know, you, you can fight a shot if you're not careful. And I, luckily I was on set for some of this and I knew that what they were trying for was that magic hour. It was shot in and around uh, sunset. So I knew that the kind of primary balance for this was always going to be a, a warmer white, a more D65 kind of warmer white, um, oh, sorry, D60, a kind of warmer white rather than being kind of a cooler uh, color temperature. I then put a gamut limiter node in here. That's purely a technical thing because of the color space that I'm working in. And, and I kind of have that there just downstream just to stop any kind of things completely flying out of gamut before I start. So occasionally you might get odd kind of random bits of lens flare or something that go way beyond the color gamut that go way beyond exposure limit. And I just have there, that as a keep net just to stop things kind of polluting my adjustments as I go forwards. Um, then to get some color separation, so this balance is basically the exposure, the saturation, the white balance all in one node. That could be three separate nodes if you wanted to. But then I go to this um, to get some color separation from this warmth. I've added a bit of an additional blue. I've pushed the blue values with a custom curve. Then I've got a little grad filter in, which again was a cinematographer just talking about wanting to bring some of this kind of sky down a little bit, but also give kind of heart back to that era of grad filters, filters in a matte box, so on and so forth. It's part of the look as well as being a, a kind of a compositional element. And then also what I tend to do is isolate and qualify the whites and the blacks separately, just so I can just give them a little bit of contrast at the very top or the very end and control them at the very tips of the kind of exposure level, uh, just to kind of control those separately. Uh, and that's something I do. It's quite a delicate qualification. I don't want it to be too harsh, too noisy. 
but that's something I do then. And then I tend to have a, what I call a legal node, uh, which is just kind of trying to desaturate some of the shadows. Because again, one of the things that often can give away or kind of cause issues as well is that I tend to put a, a luma versus saturation node and I tend to kind of desaturate the very darkest uh, point of the shadows. Um, it's not always needed, but sometimes you can kind of put too much pollution into your shadows, which looks kind of strange at the very darkest limit. Um, and this is all sitting under a custom print emulation um, node tree here. You can see I've got a, a group of nodes grouped together. And what's in there is a, that could be a LUT, that could be a print LUT. So it could be that you've found out that there's a certain print uh, um, a LUT or print stock that you want to mimic. You've done a bit of research and you want that on the end of your chain. So all the time I'm grading underneath that, but this is a particular, this is a node tree because I'm working in the ACES C referred color space. So I can't use LUTs. Yeah, and I'm not a fan of LUTs because they're a bit destructive and I want the flexibility to change those things later on. So all of these adjustments have been made under this print emulation. Now, obviously, print emulation was something that was a necessary thing when you were going from digital back to celluloid for projection. Now we tend to use print LUTs or print kind of emulations as just a look thing, yeah, to kind of hark back to a celluloid-like feel or patina yeah, to the image. But that's kind of the way that I built up that shot. Uh, again, I can only really show you this shot from this scene, but then just trust me that once I got to this balance stage, that's where I'd normally stop when the client or the cinematographer comes in. And then everything after that point is done in conjunction with, with the cinematographer, with the director. So noise reduction first for me, then onto the balancing, then everything else is there sat dormant in my default node tree until it's necessary. And some shots, it's just not necessary to some do some of these things. Um, so that's me kind of just workflow. Again, I could show you shot from shot, but it would just be a repetition of a theme really. Um, I'll just show you the Y waveform. You can see again, um, even though my primary adjustment might have been, you know, if, if it comes in primary level is boosted up there with high contrast, that's strong signal. Yeah. They're exposing to the right, they're getting strong signal into the camera, but then to get the feel of the piece, you know, this is meant to be, you know, we're often, there's often, we're often guilty sometimes when we're starting out of thinking that every shot has to be zero hundred. Yeah. Brightest point, darkest point. But if you think about something like an Ansel Adams scale for cinematography and lighting, you know, make a creative decision to say, do you want your highlights to be a perfect hundred? Do you want them kind of clipped? Do you want no tonality in your highlights? Or do you want your highlights to have some tonality? They might be an eight on a one to 10 scale. Do your shadows, do you want them to be completely black or do you want them to have tonality as well? And that comes from observation. Yeah, loading lots of images, screen grabs from those films that you're trying to use as, as a starting point, load them into a YUA film, load them into a vector scope, study them, look at them. I think that's the big thing I want to take away from today really is just be a student, investigate, try things out. Uh, don't just think there's a plugin or an effect that will do the job for you. Just research it, break it down, figure it out. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to switch back to my next thing, which is, it's almost like I planned it. I kind of was talking about the film thing. Um, film is not a plugin. I like these catchy phrases. It just helps me re remind of me things. Um, so the big thing, and one of those things I often get asked about or asked to do is the kind of how to create the film look. Okay. And there's some fantastic plugins out there. There's some fantastic effects. Again, they only work if you're working within a certain color space, typically Rec 709. And they only typically work if you've got a neutral image in the first place. So again, that's why that primary adjustment is so important to go first, because a lot of these film like lookup tables or print emulations are expecting a neutral image to come in. Yeah. So you're just going to put pollution on pollution if you don't get that initial neutralization bit ready first. Um, but I would say there's no one way to do it. There's no one plugin that's perfect. There's no one methodology that's perfect. Um, but the thing I would advocate is that you need to find your own way that suits you, which it sounds just like I'm passing it off. But really, it's about being a student and investigating. Yeah, be a critical investigator, be a creative problem solver. So what I mean by that is, you know, there's lots of websites out there. That's the beauty of the internet where you can say, right, what was this film shot on or what was this film printed to? And then you can find out, oh, right, it was a Kodak 2393, yeah, print um, stock. What does that mean? Okay, well, I'll do a bit of research and I go to the Kodak website and they say, oh, it had a particularly warm white point or it had cyans or blues in the shadows. And you go, all right, that's starting to give me a sense of where this might be going. 
And then you could do a bit more research because you know the name of the stock now and you've done, you've looked at that and you say, right, it's the typical grain profile of that. Oh, you can find out. Oh, it was, you know, it was all right at 400 or 200 ASA. You know, it had a bit of noise here, but it was mainly in the shadows and not in the highlights or the or vice versa. So by looking at these things and breaking them down, you're kind of building your own kind of procedural effect or procedural look in the back of your mind. But for me as well, it's not just simply a case of lobbing some noise on something and even just matching its kind of tints in the highlights and the shadows. It's a little bit more than that. And again, just take the time to just become a student of celluloid. You know, you don't have to have it in your hands to kind of find information about it. And what I've got is a particular checklist that I kind of have, or I've tried to put it down for you guys really, is the first thing I look for is the kind of patina or textual qualities of a film stock. So if someone says, I like the look of this film, then you find out what that film stock was hopefully. And, and you kind of then go from there. You also could probably find out what camera it was shot on, what lenses it used. Um, also just try and find out the aberrative qualities of film negatives and lenses, yeah? So every lens kind of type has a particular aberration to it, whether it be edge to edge softness, whether it be the amount of vignetting, whether it had a slightly green tinge to its coating on it. Yeah, you can try and find those things out. And again, all of those things can help you kind of find a look that's specific to you. Also, aberrative qualities, what I mean by that is something like film halation, which I'll come on to in a sec, which is the idea that, you know, it was, it was a byproduct of film. You know, film celluloid was made up of layers uh, for blue, green and red. Yeah. And as the light went through those different layers, yeah, it kind of at different frequencies, you got the kind of green, blue, red bit of the, of the image. Uh, and then on the back, there was kind of an anti-halation kind of filter yeah to stop this kind of glowing halation around edges especially when there's a very high contrast bright light source coming in you get this halation around high contrast edges and those anti-halation kind of films would stop most of that but some would still get back through and bounce back and because the red layer was the last one in the chain as it were what you get is just a bit of the red tint going into that halation so you get a tiny bit of halation with a bit of kind of warmy red kind of tinge to it and if you look at most things that were shot on film, whether it be TV or films, if you look at an average episode of Early Lost or Walking Dead, you'll see, if you look for it around high contrast edges, you'll see this kind of warm red halation. And that's something I like to add to my stuff as well, which is more a visual effects kind of process in a way, which I'll show you. Um, look out for hue shifts, white point, black point tints, flesh tone tints of film stocks. Again, most film stock providers will tell you if those things are there and what they look like and what they are. And then just look at the general luma range, saturation and contrast of a film stock. And the be best way to do that is to look at reference images using your scopes to study them empirically, load them in and find out what the commonalities are. OK, so um, if I try and demonstrate that, then uh, what I mean by that, and especially the film halation element, I've got a shot here. And yes, you can see the common nodes. I'm, I'm that dull. I just repeat myself over and over again. But uh, one thing I like about DaVinci Resolve is I can do things pre the adjustment. Yeah. So what I tend to do is take all of my shots that are in a scene and then put them into a, uh, I group them together. And that allows me then to have this kind of nodes before the color adjustment. So it's almost as if I'm, whatever I'm applying here has been applied at the, the negative, the film negative level, rather than being kind of after the shooting process, I'm almost working with the negative itself. So you'll see there's four things available to me now, and I'm in this group pre-clip. So I've grouped all the clips together in that scene, and that allows me to have pre-clipped nodes or pre-clipped nodes. And the VFX people sat here, as well as kind of um, um, media production people or whoever, you'll see that what I've got here, if I isolate these things, is I've got basically an edge, a, an Illuma key workflow, yeah? So I've basically done a Luma key, and I've done an edge map, and I've isolated based on an edge map of all the edges in the scene the high contrast edges. I've then combined that with a Luma key. Yeah, so I'm basically only working with the high luminance values. I've got the edge, but I'm only then using the edge that's high luminance. I've combined them together. So you can see it's got relative levels of grayscale in that edge key, yeah? Where it's white, it's gonna have an effect. Where it's black, it's gonna be off. Of course, typical kind of matte work. I've then blurred that to soften it and make it more organic. And then I feed that back into the negative itself. So, and that final control, I push towards red look, both in the kind of blur control, so it's blurred more in the red channel, but also in my gain wheel here, I've just pushed slightly towards reddy orange here. 
on that final control. So basically what I'm doing is it's a very complex way of saying I've isolated the edges in the image at negative level, at film negative level in, in a sense, pre-clip. And what I'm doing is pushing some warmth into the edges where there's high contrast. What that then gives me, if I toggle this all on and off, and hopefully you can see this, and I'm going to zoom right into this image, you'll notice that there's this warm halation around these high contrast edges here, look. If I turn all these off, and hopefully this is coming across on the stream, this is without, this is with, without, with, without, with, yeah? And it's just an added bit of halation warmth. Now this did shoot, this film was shot with a pro mist filter as well, which will add a little bit of halation to edges anyway. But I've just pushed some warmth into all the high contrast edges. And that does that little touch, plus some grain. You'll see there's some grain here. I'm gonna zoom right in. Yeah, I've added some grain in here based on my research about how much grain should be on a codec 2393 print stock. With all of those things combined, it's just those little patina details, those little textual details that only comes from research, only comes from kind of looking for these things. What makes up celluloid? What are the aberrative qualities of celluloid? And if you just try and default away from a plugin and consciously try and research these things out, you'll often find things that no other plugin can do or thinks about. Uh, and that's what I would just advise really is try and find your own methodology, become a student of celluloid if that's what you're trying to do or whatever you're trying to produce. And this is also using some simple visual effects skills, yeah? Some matting skills, some edge detection skills and feeding those into your color pipeline. And again, it'll pass most people by, but it's those little touches that just kind of elevates it, hopefully elevates it beyond the video into something which is more in keeping with this kind of film-like feel from the, that you're trying to create, okay? Um, so again, I'm going through these rel things relatively quickly. I'm conscious of time and brevity, um, but, Third one, <laughs> embrace your unromantic side, okay? So this is me trying to say that some of the most profoundly useful things I do or have done or used on a project are pretty unromantic. Um, and what I mean by this is be prepared to get your hands dirty. And, and often on these projects, you are the sole colorist or often the sole VFX artist because of budgetary constraints, time constraints, people constraints, whatever. That's exciting in one way because you get to learn a lot quickly under pressure and you um, can, it's a great way of practicing how multi-skilled you are. It also offers its own challenges as well. But what I mean by this is just be aware that there's certain things that can really save you uh, by just focusing on these quite dry procedural things or, or dry procedural VFX elements. Yeah. So, I suppose try and contextualize this you still get often the opportunity to do the hero vfx shots for example to work to on a project and again i've done some cg based match move elements on this i've had to kind of paint larger things out on this but because they're narrative led and plot driven i don't want to share those or can't cannot share those at the moment but for every head falling off or car explosion that you might have in a film or whatever you're doing which is classed as a big hero visual effects shot there'll be 50 odd sensor dust spots that you have to paint out there'll be crew reflections in glass pictures there'll be wind turbines that you have to remove so on this film that i've just showed you it was shot by the sea and there's lots of shots out to sea and it's only when you blow it up on a big screen you notice that there's a ferry out out in the sea and this is a tudor drama which really didn't have kind of ferries in it uh, there's wind turbines and the big one is jet streams if you're making a period drama and you've got jet streams in the air some mainly retentive person will find them so i've painted many a jet stream kind of cloud formation out of these big skies okay so my advice would be is try and develop some solid roto skills so if you might have these brilliant kind of cg skills texture painting skills match move skills but if you're going on to work on your first indie projects where you might be the sole person doing things, then develop some solid roto skills, some rotoscopy, rotoscopy skills. doesn't matter what tool you use. You know, if you prefer After Effects over Fusion, over Nuke, over Mocha, whatever, just pick a, a tool that suits you, that you know well, but some good rotoscopy skills, roto skills are gonna get you at what you kind of tend to have to use the most. Uh, the other thing that I tend to do is when, if I can get on set, I will do. So if I can get on set, even if I know that there's only possibly going to be a key VFX shot, so there might be no visual effects shots at all, 
just out of experience, I tend to still try and get on set. And the reason for doing that is so I can take reference images. So I take a camera and I take reference images from lots of different angles of the location. I'll also capture lighting data if I can. And then also I'll capture camera data. So I'll have a chat with the, the, the assistant camera operator or the cinematographer and say, look, which, you know, we'll look at what camera they're using, try and figure out what color space they're using, you know, what color science they're using, what frame rate they're shooting on, what shutter angle or shutter speed they're using, all those type of things. All of that information might be or could be handy later on. The more information you have at hand, the better. Uh, also, I'd say some 2D, some strong 2D, 3D tracking skills are also important and they've pre proved invaluable for me at times. And I'll show you that in a sec. Um, and then little things like make sure that a clapperboard or a chip chart is in every shot. So again, if you're on set, just have a little word. And if I know they're often in a rush, especially again on smaller independent projects, time is of the essence. And sometimes these things get forgotten. But if someone could just at least, if they haven't got the clapperboard, just put their neutral reference in there for balancing and matching. Because if you've got something you know to be neutral in every shot that you get, then in the, the post-production, you've then got a reference point for, to do that initial primary correction from. A neutral gray, a neutral white, a neutral black. And obviously the chevron pattern on a clapperboard is perfect because hypothetically that should be neutral black or white. And again, I get slightly annoyed if people start to use um, different colors of marker on a clapperboard. Stick to white, stick to black, whatever you're using, just so you're add, only adding neutral values to that clapperboard. Uh, so you've got a neutral reference point. Don't pollute it with any color. And this is a shot of me for that film that I've just been showing you on Latwing. Um, I went out and basically, uh, yes, we didn't have, there wasn't much money available to kind of just get lots of high expensive kind of uh, metallic balls, great, you know, gray map balls and all these kind of things and high-end kind of nodal uh, HDRI systems. So basically what I do is I take an SLR out of me with a good old cheap and trusty tripod. I've got a random mic stand here with a, uh, a five pound metallic garden ornament, which was shiny enough for what I needed. I wasn't doing any really glass or shiny things for this. And then I just take multiple exposures of that, build an HDRI, unwrap it in, in an equi rectangular form from that um, metallic um, globe and that will get me most of the way if I ever need to add any kind of lighting data or match CG elements into these locations and if I go around every time, time I know that they're going to change a location I'll go out and do this as much as possible I'll then take a number of images in an array as I just walk around and just take multiple images and from different angles because you never know they might come in handy when painting bits out or dust busting or taking things out later on Okay, so that's the reason I do it. I tend to try and make that a habit if I can get on set. If it's not, if it's a closed set or it's just not practical for you or for them, then so be it. But if you can, it's worth doing. Okay, uh, so just to demo what I mean by some of this, ooh, uh, what I've got here is a couple of things just to exemplify this. So first off, let's stick with this project. And I've got this big shot here where we've got big open sky, fairly dramatic moment you know spent all the time getting the color right but if i show you it with the vfx off you'll notice this little line up here look yeah and that little line is a jet stream so hopefully you can see that i'm just going to zoom into it and it's these little lines that look so uniform and linear which can unpick you know and someone will focus on if they know it's there and they want to focus on it so again i did a simple kind of content aware fill in this instance that it could be done quickly um, and i did it within fusion because fusion's built into davinci resolve so it meant that i could just do it quickly and then carry on with my color once it was noticed but sometimes you don't notice these things or look past them because you're so used to seeing them but some simple rotor and tracking skills to get rid of this was just a big factor. And they're very common in these types of project. Um, there were also some ferries out at sea as well from different reverse angles of this scene, which I had to then take out as well. Again, and that can be, it's not particularly romantic, it's not particularly exciting, but it's a necessary evil that often has to be done. Uh, and I suppose that's what I was trying to exemplify there. Also, if I load up another project, which is from another film that's currently active, which is called uh, Mindset. Uh, and this is starring Steve Oram, Elish Cahill, Peter Bancoli, and Jason Isaacs. Um, and again, this was shot in the East Midlands uh, by a, uh, a number of kind of uh, experienced professionals, but also with uh, students from the university I work on as well. And, and basically what you'll see here is you've got Steve Oram 
uh, in a kitchen scene look and you think all is going well it's just going to cache now look all's going well this has been color graded but one thing that was bugging um the, the director and the cinematographer if i turn the adjustments off is that you can see hopefully you can see this there's the lantern and crew reflected in the glass on this picture frame and again when you're working really quickly and you're working you know on a really low shoestring budget across a really tight schedule you don't notice these things you don't think to kind of maybe take out the glass or not have things perpendicular to the camera in this way so i had to go through i tracked basically luckily steve didn't cross this picture so i just did a simple 2d track of this picture frame and then repainted in the frame that was missing and this white element here so i couldn't do a content aware but basically i painted those things out and it's then static and again i did this in fusion so if you go back to my fusion nodes it's basically a simple media in did a planar tracker then fed that tracker data into a paint node and I just painted out and cloned. And the way that I did that is I just fr did a freeze frame um, of the shot at this point. Uh, I painted it out just on one frame, tracked the movement of the footage, and then basically just masked in the bit that was frozen around the picture frame. So everything else was moving, but my freeze, and that's just a really good way. So you don't have to clone every frame. You just freeze a good frame, paint it out on that one frame, and then as long as someone doesn't cross it, you can just mask and cut out that one area that's frozen and track it to the movement and you're done. Okay, so again, it's little things that you can look past, but often this is the stuff that you have to do. Um, I haven't painted it quite perfectly, but you get away with it. Look, there's a bit of a bulgy frame there, but, you know, in the big scheme of things, I could just argue it's refraction in the glass because that's the thing. Okay, um, so yeah, and another one. Uh, here's a shot that was a time-lapse shot. So you've got your, your main protagonist in front of the window here. It's kind of a long track in, time lapse, kind of sped up, so on and so forth. Sky replacement in here based on the Luma key. So if you look at the shot before and then shot afterwards, yeah, that's a color grade in a sky replacement. But what was also the problem is if I play this back, I just want you to focus in and around, obviously, the most important bit, which is the actress's head here. You can hopefully see the reflection of the crew who are filming this moving about and they didn't notice it in the small viewfinder on the camera they also didn't notice it um, because you know it's a time lapse it was only when it was sped up you could notice this movement so in a similar fashion using the same process i took the wide shot i froze a frame i then repainted in what i thought this house and this hedge would look like behind elish's shoulder behind her head i only painted enough to kind of get rid of this froze that frame tracked it to this movement which again was a simple planar tracker because it stays pretty perpendicular and then i then just masked around did a rotor around her head and shoulder so then no longer is that reflection hopefully there distracting the audience but again that was only possible really because i was there on set i took reference images but also i was looking for those things and i just had some standard roto skills i had some standard tracking skills and again i didn't have to use fusion i could have used after effects i could have used mocker i could have used new whatever you you prefer you know the tool that suits you is the you know that you're familiar with is the best tool for the job um it just happened that i wanted to do it because i'm basically lazy and i don't want to leave the bit of software that was color grading in so i just fed it into my color pipeline within davinci resolve itself um but that all comes from just that idea that i suppose that recognition that not every visual effects shot you're going to work on and show that you're going to work on, especially in indie kind of things, it's looking out for those small details, being prepared to do those small things, because that will be most of your, your time often in these types of projects. And then last thing is just a bit, a bit of advice, really, is just to be get to know your color spaces. Um, so I, I'm sure that Sam and the like and all your lecturers have already talked about color spaces and things like that. And I do not want to preach to the converted. I don't want to kind of go over old ground. But in an effort to just to kind of simplify what I mean by this and why it's important is just even just if you're aware that there's kind of two types of color space broadly. Yeah, you've got your scene referred color spaces, your working color spaces, if you will. And you've got your display referred color spaces. And as long as you know, you go, you're conscious of what color space is coming in and what you've got what you want to go out to you're going to be in a good place and just having an awareness that you need to be aware of those things is a good thing to be as well 
And that's, that's especially pertinent with indie projects where you're not working into an established show where there's a post-production supervisor where someone is completely controlling all this stuff and giving that advice and saying, do it this way. And also most big budget films, they know they're going to cinema. You know, they know there's a, almost a, there's a regular, consistent, well laid out plan for how this thing will always work. Yeah, you start the project, you know exactly where it's going and where it needs to go. Often with smaller short films, independent feature films, you don't know what's going to happen to it. It might go on Vimeo, it might go on YouTube, it might never go anywhere, or it might it might go to cinema. Yeah, you you know you have these broader aspirations. So the more you know and can manage this process, the better off you're going to be. Yeah. So in an effort to kind of simplify this down, best way to think of the scene referred color spaces is the idea that scene referred standards or color spaces do not tend to worry about making their values match that of a display. Yeah, they, in essence, they do not make compromises. Yeah, they try and preserve as wide a range of chroma and luma values as possible so that you as artists can manipulate them effectively, sometimes referred to as input or working color spaces, depending on which tool you're using and which person you're talking to. Yeah, so basically scene referred color spaces are those broader data rich kind of color spaces that aren't worried about looking good on a display like a TV or a computer monitor. In fact, they'll probably look God awful. Yeah, because the display won't know what to do with them. But a display referred color space is something where it does make a compromise. Yeah, it says, right, if it's going to be on a HD TV, it needs to be Rec 709, ideally at the moment. Yeah, because we can trust that most TVs are going to achieve the, the restricted color gamut and they'll recognize the power function of that particular color space. Yeah. Or if it's a, um, a, a computer monitor, it's going to be sRGB. Or if it's going to be uh, a printer, yeah, professional printer, it's going to be CMYK. It doesn't have to just be screens. Or if it's a cinema projection standard, it would be DCI XYZ 2.6 gamma or something like this. Yeah. Just knowing what's coming in being conscious of that and what's then going to possibly go out will actually save you a lot of trouble later on, but also it will give you confidence and it'll help you predict issues. Um, so to give you a few examples, scene referred color spaces, you've got things like data straight from a digital film camera, like Sony S log three stroke S gamma. You've got red log three G 10 wide color gamut RGB. You've got Ari log C and stroke wide gamma. So basically with the color space, I have, you probably know this already. You're talking about two things, really. You're talking about the color gamut. In other words, how much color can it reproduce and store uh, based on our uh, on the kind of baseline of the human's perception? So a color gamut, most color gamuts are either called a wide color gamut or a kind of a restricted color gamut. And that restriction or that wide color gamut is based on how closely they match the human kind of perception, the kind of average human perception of color. Yeah, and we and that was established back in the 1930s that roughly every human roughly kind of sees about this much color. Yeah, with a priority on things like green over blue. Um, and that's expressed as a triangle on a, a chromaticity chart. Then S log three, for example, sorry, S gamma, for example, is much wider than that. So often it can store much more color uh, than the human perception can see or perceive, yeah? Uh, but something like Rec 709, which is a display color space, which we typically kind of go towards, that's got quite a restricted color gamut, yeah? It's not, it can't even reproduce what the human perception of color is. So as long as we know that there's compromises with display often, but there's loads of data in the, the uh, scene referred, we know we have to manage the big scene referred data, whether it's a log-based one, a raw-based one, into the restrictions of our display referred color space. We need to shift them, we need to manage them. Um, and the reason I keep mentioning Rec 709, Gamma 2.4, if you want the full title, is the idea that one of the most popular standards is a display color space, which is Rec 709. Yeah, and if you weren't already aware, things like DaVinci Resolve def default to Rec 709, Gamma 2.4, Adobe Premiere does, uh, Final Cut does, Avid, it screams at you when you open it up and want to create a project, do you want to do it in Rec 709? So it's been around for a long time and it is a kind of baseline display standard that we can all stick to. Um, so it's pretty much the thing that when TV manufacturers, uh, video cameras, uh, video projectors, the kind of baseline display standard they'll try and mimic is Rec 709 Gamma 2.4. Yeah, the restricted color gamut of Rec 709 and the and the power function of Gamma 2.4. They'll try and match that. Yeah. Now, why is that important to know? Well, 
the beauty of knowing this, if you're just aware of the fact that those things are the kind of baseline starting points for all these different bits of software and these cameras and HD TVs, um, if you know that, and that's the focal point, that's often the starting point, is that there's a number of well-established workflows out there for, for transferring from Rec. 709 to other color spaces. So if you further down the line have graded in Rec. 709 and you know that, you just know the words that they're there and those numbers, someone might say, right, could you transfer, could you supply as a TIFF sequence in XYZ? And you think, oh God, what's that? But if you know that you've worked in one standard, you can then do a bit of research and say, how do I transfer from Rec. 709 into XYZ? And at least you're starting from a, an informed point of view. And you'll find that there's an established workflow out there somewhere to do that process because you're aware of the display standard you're working in. And also, if you know what scene referred standard is coming in, yeah, don't just take the footage, ask the question, go back to the cinematographers, be on set and ask those awkward questions when they're trying to film and you're going, what color gamut did you use? What gamma did you use? Can you tell me please? Because that's going to save a lot of time later on because you can know what's coming in as well as, well as what's going out. Um, and also the other beauty of Rec. 709 and start using that as your baseline starting point, which would be my recommendation for you guys initially, is that the gamma is also virtually identical to sRGB. So in terms of the color gamma, Rec. 709 and sRGB virtually have the same color gamma. They just have a slightly different gamma function, um, transfer function, sorry. So because they have a similar gamma, you know if you work in Rec. 709, it's not only going to look all right on a HD TV or projector, it's also going to look pretty good and pretty accurate on a computer monitor, a phone, a kind of computer projector, yeah, which is the kind of sRGB display standard more often than not. Okay, so if we work within Rec. 709 standard as our baseline, um, then in our color grade, then we know it will be widely supported. And for example, e.g. Adobe Premiere, Final Cut and Resolve are all Rec. 709 by default. So just knowing the words, knowing the names, being aware that they're there will hopefully then get you into the habit of checking what color space is coming in, both in terms of its gamut and in terms of its gamma, and then also what you're going out to. The other reason that I mentioned Rec. 709 is a really good starting point for you guys, but also for indie people as well, is not only its association with sRGB and its wider support, but also it's easier to find monitors when you're starting out as a colorist or a VFX artist that support Rec. 709 you know, and it's affordable, it's manageable. Also, when you're trying to buy a monitor, you can look out for those things. You can say, it might say it can only reproduce 80% of Rec. 709 or sRGB. Well, that's going to be no good for you. It's better to maybe lose a bit of G-Sync or some gaming functions and actually get something that maybe is 100 quid cheaper, but can support 100% of that gamut. So just being aware that those things are important is, a, I think, an important step forwards. And I just want to finally demonstrate what that means to me on a project. Um, you would have noticed, hopefully, that I've said that both of these, these films that I've been showing, you've either been shot raw or they've been shot in a log-based scene-referred format. But when I've been toggling the grade off, they haven't been looking that raw or that flat. You know, when we normally associate a scene-referred color space, a big wide color a gamma with a weird gamma function, you know, if we bring raw data in, it often looks milky and flat, yeah, because the display doesn't know what to do with it, yeah? In other words, we've told the software that Rec. 709 could be coming in. Um, it doesn't know what how much gamma to pull back on to make that palatable on your display. So it just shows it as flat, as milky. But um, with these shots, they've got quite a bit of contrast. They look Rec. 709-y when they come in. And that's because underneath the hood in both of these projects, I've been using color management. In other words, because I've got the knowledge of what color space is coming in, and because I know what I want to go out to, I've been letting DaVinci Resolve do the initial bit of color management. So I've told it, this color space is coming in. This is the color space I want to work in and display to. And this is what I've calibrated my system to is Rec. 709, for example. Why have I done it that way? Well, if I come to the color management bit, I'm using ASUS. And ASUS is the kind of new, kind of almost new magical scene referred color space, which is trying to become a standard across the whole film production um, world, really. And the idea is, is that you, ASUS's goal really is to say, right, we know lots of, mathematically, we know lots of color spaces, what color gamut they have, what power function they have. That's all well established. And then if you want to mix lots of different camera color spaces together on one film, as long as you flag or tag what that color space is coming in, and again, you'd need to know what it is to be able to do that effectively, ASUS will then magically 
transfer it into this one huge color space, this massive scene referred ACES color space. So what it does, it takes raw files, uh, S gamut files, you know, it brings them all in and then it converts them first off to this big wide color space, this big wide gamut. And it just leaves it there in a linear gamma. Yeah. So it just basically make, you know, puts it to this big linear color space and the VFX artist here will be aware of that. And then once that's done, it, you then say, what do I want it to send it to? Whether it's Rec 709, XYZ, and it will mathematically take your grade and automatically transfer what you've done as a color grade to that display standard. Why is this important to know? Well, any form of color management, let's say your project does better than you thought. You were aiming for Rec 709 in computer monitors, and then suddenly you, someone says, this is really good. It'd be great to see it at the cinema but the cinema wants a DCP and they want it in X, Y, Z color space. And you think, well, well I've graded it for Rec 709. And if that's all baked in and I've used Rec 709 looks and everything like this, how do I do that? Well, hypothetically, ASUS just allows you just to change the output device transform to a different wider color space or something like that. You click on it, say P3, say for example, and it will mathematically and automatically do that transfer for you. And you wouldn't have to regrade hypothetically. Also, if you're a visual effects artist sending shots back and forth between a colorist, then what you can do is that ASUS has its own CG linear format and you can output to ASUS linear, send that linear file to a CG platform like Maya, like Blender, like whatever, Nuke, where linear is the kind of, is the, is the way that light and luma and gamma works in most CG things. You can do your CG work, not limited by a display or a color space. Do your work, send it back in a linear ACES fashion, and then it'll just populate as if it's a camera feed coming in, recalculate the math and scale it accordingly automatically for you. So in other words, if you know what color space it was shot on, you know what color space you're going to, you can then make educated decisions and you can do your research so you're more flexible, you're more adaptable to the changing, I suppose, fate of projects that you're working on. Um, so I know that was all very kind of wordy, but hopefully that gave you some insights into things that could be useful. Um, hopefully that was enlightening, or at least it put a different a spin on things that you might have already done. I suppose now, um, even though that we only had an hour really to talk about things, which is not enough time to go through the whole kind of 30 odd years I've been doing this. But if, if you want to ask any questions, obviously, please put those through in the the, the comment section that's is it the q a section sam am i right in saying that yeah that's right yeah the q &A i don't want to i don't want to cross the streams and break the rules uh yeah so yeah drop it in the q a and then sam will pass any questions you might have on to me if you've got no questions i won't be offended that's either means i've done a good job or you just not you don't care so either way suits me but um yeah if sam if there's any questions if you could ask them that'd be great and i'll try and answer them as best i can we've got a few already which is great um the, uh, the first one's from Edward, uh, who asked, what is the most difficult project you've worked on so far? And I guess in addition to that, what made it uh, a, a tough project? Um, good question. To be honest, I had a, um, a kind of web series that was passed on to me. I wasn't involved in the early stages of the production, so I wasn't on set. Um, I wasn't kind of even in discussions before it or after it. It was just handed on to me, and it had been shot um, with a lot, uh, with a lossy codec, uh, with lots of chroma subsampling, lots of macro blocking, but had been shot in a scene referred log color space. So basically taken, basically just trying to push weak signal and push and, all you, and exposing noise and macro blocking, all these kind of things. Um, most shots weren't white balanced. Um, but if you've got no color data in the, in the image in the first place to then try and re-white balance it, there's loads of noise. So you have to noise reduce loads. It was, I think, it was probably because I wasn't involved in an early stage and that's not me being, well, it is a bit, um, being kind of self gladiatory but I think the earlier you can be on your project, I suppose that's the lesson. If you can't be there, they're the hardest ones because you've got less information to work with. You've got less knowledge about the color space. You've got less input into why did you shoot that way in the first place when you had a separate recorder to at least bypass some lossy compression. Um, if you're not, involved in the early stages. If you can be involved, I suppose the flip side of this, be involved in the early parts of the stages, your life will be a lot easier. If you can't be, they can be the trickiest projects. Brilliant. 
Uh, Joe is doing um, a stop motion using green screen uh, and making backgrounds in Unreal. Yeah. Uh, and so his question is, how difficult is it to create virtual lights to match the original lights for the stop motion animation? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so is this kind of, just thinking aloud, is this kind of like um, using the kind of uh, real-time VFX element of Unreal in virtual production? Or is this the idea that you've rendered some static Unreal backgrounds and then are compositing uh, stop motion over the top? I suppose I'm asking a question to avoid, yeah. aren't I? I yeah. yeah. Well, let, let's say it's static backgrounds. Then I think um, that sounds pretty tricky, but I would, I know it seems pretty obvious, but do the backgrounds first, establish the lighting position, establish your lighting intensity to your taste, and then try and match the lighting on the stop motion rather than the other way around. Um, I would say the same, for example, with VFX, wouldn't it? If, you, if you're shooting a live action plate first, that then should dictate the lighting rather than the other way around. Obviously, if you can start with a concept art or a storyboard first, then the shot will be dictated by that. But um, yeah, the more you can, yeah, if you've got a reference point, and I suppose you yours wouldn't be a photographic reference, it would be a CG reference in terms of the Unreal background, then yeah, look out for, you know, I suppose, look out for things i know and, and the good thing about unreal if i remember rightly is that a lot of its lantern based kind of settings talks in real world terms so it talks about in terms of uh, uh kelvin ratings for white balance it talks in terms of inverse square law it, uh, and then you could probably just do a bit of math and say right if my static light that i put in had this kind of um this kind of softness to the shadows uh, was this far away from where I think the subject will be. You could probably then match that in real world terms by almost mimicking the same kind of relative intensities. And does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. Um, it sounds like it made sense to me, but my extent of knowledge of Unreal is very slim. Yeah, yeah I'm so trying to kind of, <laughs> yeah. Um, so Sam, who has a strong name, has asked, when you uh, first used ACES for the first time, did it present any hiccups? Was it uh, a massive overhaul of your workflow? Yeah, and the big thing for me uh, with ACES is that it's not the end of the world for me because I was never a big user of plugins or presets or LUTs, but you can pretty much throw most of those things out the window because um, if you think about it, if we're working in this huge ACES color space, so every input color space that's coming in is going to be put into this working huge color gamma, ultra wide kind of ACES color space. To then add LUTs into that chain, they're not going to work correctly because they're expecting a certain color space to come in. And most LUTs are expecting because of its commonality, Rec 709. Um, so more often than not, they're expecting either Rec 709 or something like ARRI Log C. Yeah, well established color spaces coming in. If you try and drop them into an ACES color space, it's going to just do weird things and it's not going to do the things you expect. And also if you suddenly then say, right, yes, my target output in ASUS is Rec 709, but then suddenly you change it to be P3 or XYZ, those looks that you might have in your chain are going to do weird things to that export as well. So you can pretty much forget having anything that's, that's kind of look based or preset based, which isn't the end of the world because it kind of forces you to learn what those things are doing. I think there's starting to become some kind of workflows for doing that where you put sign kind of a garret, a gamut mapping kind of exercise in the center of your grade where you you basically do convert from you know you're working in asus now you convert it from asus to log c to then put a log c lut on it and then convert that back to asus and then work from there but it's still a destructive process and you're going to lose something along the chain and that would just make me worry a little bit also um DaVinci Resolve is getting better and better at this. And I haven't upgraded to 17 yet because I don't like upgrading mid project. And because of the pandemic, the project's been delayed somewhat. So I've not updated for a while. Um, but um, it, the ASUS is getting much more intelligent, is getting much better and better. People are making looks now that and look workflows that can go into the ASUS workflow. But at the beginning, ASUS was a bit strange with your expectations of Luma changes. So for example, if you knew that a curve, an S curve would do this type of contrast adjustment, then it wouldn't be reflected because it's kind of trying to do like almost like a Rec 709 adjustment, but in a much wider ACES color, um, color space and with its own kind of linear gamma and you get weird kind of anomalies. It doesn't do what you expect it to do. But once you've got your head around it and you trust your eye and you trust your scopes, it's not the end of the world. 
Um, I would say a happy medium, and I, and I wish I'd actually stuck with it, to be honest, but because I knew there was a, quite a bit of CG stuff going on, linear stuff, I probably would have defaulted to um, DaVinci Resolve's own color management, um, which is the color managed, which is the one that predates Asus. And that's so well established as it has so many different input and output color spaces. And it just does it really nicely. And because it's done by them, every adjustment adapts accordingly. I would say start with maybe even DaVinci Resolve's color management process before jumping into Asus, if that's what you want to do. Obviously, Asus isn't an option in Premiere yet or, or Final Cut. So, Okay, brilliant. Uh, another Sam, uh, they're a VFX student in their first year, uh, and they were just wondering if you've got any recommended resources for learning about and practicing color grading and color correction. Um, there's lots. I mean, there's lots of stuff out there. I mean, there's some lots of kind of practicing colorists that have got quite popular YouTube channels. Um, if you want to get really techy and scientific, more film stock kind of emulation, all that stuff, there's two people I would recommend, which is there's a guy called Juan Malera, who's an Australian colorist and cinematographer who's at the forefront of a lot of kind of um, film stock emulations uh, and kind of mimicking film stock. Um, also, Steve uh, Steve Yedlin, who's a cinematographer and colorist for Hollywood, does a lot of really techy kind of, um, I suppose, practice-based research. And his website is full of kind of um, taking the same shot on Kodak Celluloid and then taking it on an Ari Alexa and comparing the two and seeing how he can mimic one over the other and just following those people and reading their stuff. You might not understand any of it at first, but you might just see keywords. You think, oh, right, I'll find out what that is. And you'll come back maybe like, six months later and you'll go, yeah, I kind of understand that a bit more. And um, also, um, I'm just trying to think, uh, Lift Gamma Gain is a really good forum uh, which is where most of this stuff happens really. Um, and it's just a really good f a forum to get involved in, uh, if you're interested in color work and it has, uh, obviously lift gamma gain kind of suggests the kind of old celluloid log, log based grading. Um, but also you'll get a lot of VFX artists in there as well, kind of talking about VFX pipelines in the context of color grading pipelines. So that's a good resource. Um, but yeah. On a similar sort of thread, uh, someone's asked, that they're currently using Premiere and they want to kind of uh, transition over to DaVinci Resolve. I don't know if you've moved from a, a software pre-DaVinci to DaVinci and um, if, that process, if that transition was difficult or... Um... Um, not, not less and less so because I think DaVinci Resolve's editing capabilities have become so much better than they used to be. They're still not quite up there with a dedicated uh, NLE, but they're pretty good. I would also say as well, why move away from Premiere? If you like editing in Premiere, continue to edit in Premiere. There's not a problem. Just to, just be aware that obviously you might just do your offline edit in, in Premiere. Do get some proxies if you need them. So if you've created low resolution um, kind of um, proxies so you can edit smoothly on the timeline, not have to worry about rendering times, maybe 720p kind of versions of your, I don't know, 4K, 6K raw files or log files drop those low res proxies on a timeline, as long as you don't change the frame rate and the source names. Yeah, that's the important thing. So you're not kind of getting any mismatches. You can just edit in Premiere, then just simply send an XML. So go file export XML, send an XML and import that XML into DaVinci Resolve. And it will ask you, do you want to use the proxies or do you want to reconnect connect to the camera originals? And as long as you've kept the names the same, as long as you've kept the frame rates the same, you can reconnect to the camera originals. It'll put your Premiere edit onto the timeline in DaVinci and you can use DaVinci's color grading elements from that point forward. So maybe that's the middle ground, is continue editing in what you want to edit with, which is what happens really. If you went indie projects, it works that way, but obviously big Hollywood projects, you've got editorial teams that are separate to kind of DI coloring teams and so on and so forth. So often the edit's done completely somewhere else and there's no point just sending a Premiere project file. You just send an XML, which is a universally accepted file uh, and you'd be good to go. So maybe that's the middle ground is find an effective proxy round trip or workflow. Uh, and I know there's a colorist called Aaron K who's a popular kind of YouTube art and he's, he's done, it's a quite a popular, well-established workflow. I use it as well, but he talks about a workflow between Premiere, uh, DaVinci Resolve and back again and doing that kind of thing. So that can be useful. Um, if not Premiere's color tools, if you're just working within Rec 709, Premiere's pretty good. I mean, it's not it's not DaVinci Resolve, but it's not the end of the world. I, I think the color tools in Premiere, especially with Lumetri now, are pretty good. The scopes are good. There's some nice video kind of limiting legalization tools in Premiere. So if you like it still, there's no pressure to move. Um, 
but it doesn't have the same functionality. But brilliant, thank you. Um, ben is working on a short film uh, where they've got characters speaking to or uh, uh, moving towards and away from camera wearing a, a, a mask, a blue surgical mask, uh, and they want to turn everything into monochrome apart from the mask. Um, but they're having trouble tracking the subject's face with a power window when they move away from camera. And I just wondered if you had any advice on. Uh, so it's the I, so just uh, just for clarity's sake. Though, so so basically, they're keeping the blue mask intact, but everything else monochrome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, my lazy instinct would be, why track at all? Uh, why not just film it with no other blue values in the shot apart from the mask, and then just qualify the blue or do a custom curve of the blue um, and just qualify the blue out of the image. So that's treated as separate and then create a monochromatic version of the shot underneath and just layer uh, the qualified blue element over the top of the black and white. And that means it will just track with whatever it goes because it's just looking for blue chroma um, and hue. That would be my lazy way because um, tracking can always be a bit tricky. Um, Apart from that, it, it depends from shot to shot. It depends how normalized your lighting is across the shot. It depends on, um, it might be that you simply have to handball it. You might have to just not trust the tracker. If the tracker is not sticking and you've tried everything and you've tried filtering, so it only tracks um, chroma over luma, for example, um, if that doesn't all work, then you might just have to bite the bullet and just hand roto it really. Um, but my first instinct would be, see if there's other blue values in there and if there's not try and just qualify it and with a nice denoise soft qualifier it might do the job for you or or a custom curve so you could use the custom curves in davinci resolve to isolate and pin the blue value and then bring and desaturate down every other hue and that might be able to just prioritize and fix that blue value i hope that makes sense i'm trying to think in abstract terms but so uh, Sam has asked, when working on a low-budget indie product uh, as a colorist, do you find you always do shot cleanups with roto or roto painting and tracking, or does it depend uh, who else is working on the project? It depends on how I feel on the day, to be honest. Um, it, it can be as simple as I've spent two months inside DaVinci Resolve, so I might want to change. So I just feel like going in After Effects and doing it. Or um, as I say recently, if, it can, if I can stay within the same tool, so the fact that Fusion is so feature rich now in DaVinci Resolve, then that that seems a kind of no brainer because it's tracking tools are so good and it's rotoscope uh, tools are pretty good as well. I'll even do a lazy kind of, you know, there's things built within uh, DaVinci Resolve that for most other reasons are not particularly good. But if you're just patching an area which th that nothing else crosses and it's pretty universal and it's, un it's kind of normalized in terms of its um, chroma and luma to so say that, that bit of um, jet stream in the sky, say for example, the, in DaVinci Resolve, there's a literally a spot healing, uh, spot patching tool, which you put a bit like the clone tool in Photoshop. You just put a circle over an area that you want to sample. You put the other circle over the patch you want to cover, and it just does it for you on, on a node. Um, but yeah, it will be, and it'll also be based on whether I got any reference. So for example, that shot in front of the window. It would have been ideal if I'd been there without the actress, without the camera crew, and taken a picture of that big window as a still. And then I could have just dropped that in as a blank plate in behind because I couldn't be there. And probably because I would have appeared in the window and just made the problem worse. Um, I had to kind of visualize it and paint it. Um, so yeah, it's, it just all depends. I would say just use the tool that you're comfortable with. Um, as long as you get, again, you're aware of color management and you know that if you're transferring it to another piece of software, you do, you're preserving the color spaces that you're working with. Um, then yeah, just use whatever suits you. Um, different ones for different moods, different ones for different uh, practices, really. You mentioned they're potentially spending months inside of uh, a piece of software working on a project. I appreciate this answer might be a bit of a, how long is a piece of string, but uh, roughly how long would you expect to spend on a feature film in the color grade? Um, again, it, I think, from my point of view, because I have a full-time job as a lecturer and that much of what I do then on this regard is holidays, weekends, nights, um, it will often take longer. And that's the case with a low-budget low indie films in this country. Most people working on those things 
do work on something else as their day-to-day -day job. And often this stuff then gets uh, worked around it. Um, so, but I suppose in terms of hours, then yeah, you're looking, depending on, again, it's all, like you say, how long is a piece of string? How even is the lighting? You know, how um, even things like how noisy is the image can really impact on your ability to work quickly. Because again, if you've got to noise reduce lots of stuff, then that can really slow things down. Uh, in fact, the irony is the better the footage, the better the quality, the asset that comes in, the easier things become. So it seems it always feels like the higher up you go up the chain, you'd feel like, oh no, the better the quality of the film or the production of whatever you work on, surely the harder it becomes. But in fact, it becomes easier because the footage is better. The tracking is easier because there's more pixel data, there's less data loss. Um, there's more established workflows. It will just become easier. I think that. The longest ones, though, are those ones that you haven't been involved in the beginning and you have to just unpick errors and problems and find an established workflow. The hardest thing at the moment has been liaison, is how to talk about colour critical decisions in a non-face-to-face -face situation. Normally, you'd have someone sat next to you looking at your calibrated monitor on your calibrated system. The worst thing for all colourists, and I bet all students have experienced this, you think your image looks one way, but the problem is the audience isn't color managed. They'll just have their telly, telly on 11 stupid, or they'll have their monitor with about 10% of sRGB. And they say, oh, it looks a bit saturated, or it looks a bit contrasty. And you kind of can't, you'd lose the plot if you were trying to kind of think about every possible scenario of display that people might watch this on. So you've just got to be confident that you've got the best calibrated display you've got you've worked with a proper color management system you know your scopes don't lie you're pretty much in the right position whatever it happens to it afterwards is, is is up to them but obviously you're trusting people's displays in this whole pandemic situation because you're sending them files and saying what do you think and they might be watching it on a little phone that's got about um you know two dynamic range and half srgb and you're thinking yeah you're making that judgment but it really isn't that case or that isn't green you know but uh that's been the hardest thing is that kind of liaison and i suppose um it's just asking people to watch it on the best best display they can uh what's useful is actually things like ipads and iphones where you know every note display is pretty much the same it might be equally retinary yeah which is again how much can we push magenta and brightness um, to make your icon stand out? But at least it's a known constant that you know if it looks right on your display on an iPad, say, then it might look right on theirs and similar. So they're making similar judgments. But that's been a hard thing to do. For the students that are kind of at the beginning of their, their colour grading careers, mm -hmm. um, have you got any recommendations on um, uh, monitors that can be properly calibrated? Um, rather than the quite expensive Flanders scientific monitors. That yeah, yeah, I, I think reach. I think a go-to one is, it, you'll be surprised what you get now if you can avoid, you'll have to give up some of those gamer-like features. So uh, if you, 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 I think there's a couple of priorities at the lower end. Yeah, you can forget OLED, because if you're buying an OLED at a cheaper price, it's not going to be a good one anyway, not at the moment. So you need to have an IPS panel, really. Yeah, for that color accuracy. So that's one first thing. Second thing, if you can, a 10-bit panel so to get rid of any of that kind of artifacting and to make sure that you've got a kind of a good amount of color accuracy. So IPS plus 10-bit would be a good thing to do. Um, also, look out for your display color spaces. So if you've got that awareness now that I'm working in Rec. 709 or sRGB, look for those things when buying a monitor. So if it quotes, you know, most monitors will say this, if they're proud of it, they'll say it can achieve 100% sRGB or Rec. 709. Look for that, because if it can do that, then great, that's a start. Um, and then in the best case scenario is look for something that might be able to store internal lookup tables or internal looks. So you calibrate to the monitor, not to your operating system. So in other words, you, you can bypass all the jiggery pokery of your, of your OS, which is bound to be inaccurate, um, and actually just calibrate directly and feed it into the hardware on the monitor. So yes, there's those quoted Flanders Scientific and all those kind of things, which can be, they're just cost prohibitive completely. 
But at the moment, if I was to say a brand uh, with no frills, but really color accurate, some of the lower level uh, AZO monitors are really good. So the EIZO uh, built like a tank will last you probably forever, really uniform across the surface. And I would argue go lower resolution, but get higher color accuracy. Uh, that's another thing I'd give up because you could be working on a 4K project but just output to 1080p and then just scale up when you export. You don't have to necessarily view it at the resolution that you're working at. Um, that will speed up your, your hardware as well. That'll make your lower end hardware go further as well. Um, so I would, yeah, nothing wrong with a good quality, accurate 1080p monitor that's got no frills, but just is color accurate, is uniform, and best case scenario, can store a lot in it. So ASOs, there's some... I say affordable, but around the 500 pound mark, which is a lot cheaper than a Flanders Scientific, or you can get a nice 1080p, you know, with a, can store lookup tables, really color accurate, guaranteed that what you see on there, if it's calibrated, is gonna look nice. Also some of the BenQ things as well. Uh, BenQ tend to make a lot of kind of, um, they'll sometimes call them like um, design monitors or monitors for CG work. Yeah, they'll brand them by, and it might put you off initially if that's not what you think you're interested in, but just dig a bit deeper. And if they say 100% Rec 709, 100% sRGB, 10-bit panel, good to go. You know, that will, and you can get those even cheaper than that more often than not. So if you're willing to sacrifice some game stuff, some resolution, some refresh rates, um, and just focus on color accuracy, that's, that's the big deal, really. And if it can be calibrated, great. Great. I'm going to just jump back. You said uh, uh, in your last answer about um, the challenges of talking to clients uh, about the colour accuracy when you're not with them in, in yeah. person. What sort of challenges do you find when you actually are with them in person? Is there, is there often a barrier of understanding of it's looking like this on this screen, but when you watch it on your phone or at home, it'll look different? Yeah, well, I think it's the eternal thing. It never goes away. And we've all had those moments if you've done something like this you've watched it on like a, a film festival and they've dropped all of the short films onto one timeline and then re-rendered them out and they've maybe done a contrast adjustment to somehow match all the color grades together across different films and your heart sinks and i think the important thing is not to take your pressure take the pressure off yourself you can't control those things just control the things you can control and if it looks right on your scopes and it looks right on your accurate hopefully calibrated monitor if they're looking at that as well then that's all you can do but ultimately they're the take the pressure off yourself as well and let them have that decision because if they make a decision and say no i want the blacks to be crushed i want the highlights to be have no tonality in them ultimately that's their choice um so then when it does look a bit crunchy on a screen that's not calibrated right or it's just come straight off the showroom on a, or whatever that was at least their decision not yours um but you can offer that you know you are allowed to say well yeah if we do flatline it at the top and bottom we are going to have to be aware that we might just need to soften this a bit because you're going to push data out of gamut because especially in the shadows where all that kind of pollution can be in the chroma that's often what sends gamma errors are often in the shadowy areas so you sometimes have to sacrifice a bit of zero binary uh, blackness in the shadows for for legality as well keeping one eye on that if you hope to have it at least presented accurately or even broadcast in the future you need to be aware of those things Brilliant. Uh, callum was wondering as a as a colorist uh and do some and work in vfx what would you consider the best part of your job best part of my job uh I suppose the other thing, I, I know it's going to sound really cheesy, but it's that idea of embracing the fact that you never know everything and you're going to end and embracing the fear that you get at every beginning of every project. And I learn something new on every project. So what seems like the end of the world at times, because I catastrophize quite quickly, or if it feels like you just don't know how to do something, if your instinct then is to just learn or ask questions, then every project you learn something. And I think that's the best bit of it. Um, and embrace the collaborative side of it. It's really hard to let go of stuff. Um, and I think with age and experience comes that little bit of confidence that actually you learn as much from other people as you do from yourself. 
And I say some of the best things I've learned, I could claim some of the things I've said today, I've not necessarily learned from myself. I've learned from working with other people. And I think if you're open to criticism and as long as it's polite and collegial criticism, then I, they're the best things. They're the best projects to work on is where you've got that honest, open, critical, but fair kind of um, relationship going on. And you'll learn things in that way. And often they're born out of pressure. Yeah. What's that cheesy line that diamonds are born from high pressure. They're just dirt or coal that's put under. High, yeah. Whatever. I think it was from Luke Cage, wasn't it? Um, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe, probably maybe. my, um, points of reference are not all that, um, <laughs> grand. So just, I guess we should wrap up one final question, um, from Cashel, what project are you most proud of? Is it, you know, um, and why are you proud of that project? Firstly, hi cash. Um, uh, most proud of um doo -doo 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 -doo. i think again not wishing to to name names too much um and separate things out but also i think the proudest one is probably the one i've been showing first off today um because again without going into too much details of that you know that was shot on virtually nothing but looks like something does that make sense it's that not my part my ports passed just a tiny bit but that was shot so quickly with so many people just working you know not sleeping for days and just kind of just working and putting the heart and soul into it and it looks like something that was cost so much more um that and there's just something about it that feels has that organic patina about it it feels organic the performances are beautiful. The, the lighting's beautiful. The team that worked on it on set did a fantastic job all around. And you just look at it and you think, yeah, that, that looks like something that does. Um, so, and that's not to say that other things don't. It's just, I think just the situation and the whole, um, I suppose, brevity and tension of that production to produce something the way it does on such a tight, it, you know, it was shot over what you'd normally shoot a short film on and it's a period drama and it's shot pretty much completely wide all of the time. And it's, you know, it's just, yeah. So that one, for those reasons, I know they're not very specific, but there's, there's something about that. That's yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for spending some time with us today. Um, at industry week and thank you everyone for your questions that you, you've put in today as well. Uh, just before you all disappear, remember that we've got a, a, a talk with Russell Davis this afternoon, so please uh, make sure uh, that you join us um, for that. John, if you wouldn't mind just sticking around as the students disappear, that would be great. And talk yeah, a sure. Bit afterwards. Uh, to everyone else, thank you very much. And thank you, all of you. Thank you for your patience and hopefully you got something from it.
Hi, John. Thanks for waiting around. Quite the, uh, the popular talk, not just among uh, students, but quite a few staff members have messaged all the well, the, the four of us that are in here saying how much they've enjoyed it. Um, oh, that was okay, was it? Yeah, it was, it was great, you, yeah. you never know when you're doing it, and kind of I was trying to keep it short, but to the point. No, I think you really. I mean, some of mine have said they're going to uh, they're going to have to watch it again just because they, you know, they, you kind of open their eyes to new things, which is really good. Um, so thank you very much for that. That's no um, problem. We've got. Um, like so, well, a couple of follow-up questions we just wanted to yeah, yeah, sure. uh, record yeah, no people problem. saying. So um, the first one is, have you got any advice for our students looking to get into the creative industries? Oh, blimey. Um, I think it, it's just, just do, I suppose. Uh, just make, I mean, look out, especially just get involved in local. There's so many good local um, things going on, I, sp I suppose in a film sense, you know, and that could be relevant to all of them is the idea of getting tied into the BFI networks, both the, the national ones, but the regional ones. Um, it's amazing how many, you know, cause I've done a few BFI shorts now and it's amazing how many faces you see pop up from the local area. And then the more you get to know them, the more then you either get invited by proxy or you kind of form a working relationship and then they might be working on a project and they seek out people they trust. So I know it's an old adage, networking, but but getting involved in those local networks because they are there and they are pretty strong, especially around here. East Midlands, Nottingham, of course, Lincoln, Leicestershire. There's a really strong collegiate kind of um, community that's willing to kind of get people involved. And as long as you're willing to take a bit of your time, probably work for free, which is most of the, the case, especially on this type of thing, then you never know where it might lead. And then it'll just give you that connection to then move forwards um so that would mean my from my point of view i'd say that's a really healthy thing to do um and also just make and distribute your own stuff it's so easy now you know you can take control of your own destiny you don't have to go through distributors you don't have to go through the complexities of um the kind of legal managing kind of side of it you can just simply make it put it wherever you want and as long as it's good people like it then it's it'll it'll deal well so um I think the other thing as well is just actually, as you're learning stuff, put it back into the community. So if you learn stuff and then you're willing to share it back to the community, you'll often find that you get you get experience by doing it, by synthesizing that information down and re, kind of reselling, as it were, repackaging it. But also it just gets attention um, and it can prove that you, you are someone who's capable of doing it in a different way. So I don't know yeah. if that helps. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I, I, my second question, I suspect there's something in what you just said, really, but um, do you have a specific message for our confetti students? Um, in just embrace the, the look that you have. Embrace the fact that you've got the facilities you've got. And by facilities, I don't just mean rooms, kit. I mean the lecturing staff as well. You know, it's embrace that information. Um, drain them of every bit of resource they have, knowledge, um, the equipment itself because you don't know how lucky you are to have access to that kind of thing until you haven't got it anymore um, but also coming back to what I was saying at the beginning just embrace the fact you're going to be a lifelong student you never know going to know it all and why would you don't put the pressure on yourself to be the finished article when you leave whether it's your FE course or HE course that's just unreasonable people don't expect that of you um, but as long as you're willing to learn and when you're confronted by challenges, trying to figure them out and, and embrace that challenge, you'll be good to go. Um, but yeah, trust all those things that your lecturers say, because they're, they're not doing it to trip you up. Why would, that, would they do that? That would make their lives miserable. Um, take the knowledge they're giving on board, use it as a catalyst then to find your own knowledge and don't think you're gonna get all the answers from the people in front of you, their job isn't that. Their job is to give you that stimulus to then go and be the lifelong learner yourself and find out that information. And as long as you've got that hunger, you'll be fine. Brilliant. Thank you very much, John. That's all the things I've got to ask you. Um, so just, again, thank you very much for spending some time with us today. Uh, that footage looks amazing. I'm, that is incredibly impressive. Oh, all right, cool. There. Yeah. Um, and you're great on it. It looks, it looks incredible. Like, you know, the, I, was, I was amazed at the difference between, you know, when you turn all the nodes off and... Um, you saw the original versus what you've graded together. And it, Fantastic. It, oh, thank you. But it, it just comes from observation. It really does. It's, it's, it's obviously watching a lot of stuff of that here helped. 
you know, because I'm of an age and most of my kind of films that I was inspired by were, you know, things like Deer Hunter and kind of Days of Heaven and all those kind of things, so Badlands. So that look, it might be ingrained in me somewhere. I might have just grain in my memories. Um, and I think I've got halation on every one of my memories too. But um, but also, even if we're completely digital, even if you're never going to handle any film in your life, which is probably not going to be the case, still learn about it because people still want that look. They still want that tactile feel. And you can only do that by studying stuff. And use your scopes, not just for checking your own work, but by analyzing other people's work. There's some great websites now like Shot Deck, uh, where you can, um, they've basically just got color accurate still grabs from loads of films and it just put in a database just for colorists to download and view and study them by looking at them on the vector scope, looking at them on the parade and a Y waveform, breaking down what they're doing, what was the brightest white on this film? And oh, you realize, oh, blimey, they didn't go above like an eight. Mm. That's weird. Uh, or their blacks never got close to like zero at all. You look at a lot of Cohen Brothers stuff, they're quite milky in, as a black point and they kind of clip out. So the more you study stuff, you realize, all right, it is okay to do that. So let's see what happens. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, John. Um, and no hopefully we'll keep in touch. Uh, yes, definitely. Awesome. Thank you very much. You take care. And you. See you soon. See you soon. Bye. See you.